when did you get your first V? My first V, I mean, I was playing guitar for 10 years before I got my first V. So I was playing, well, anything that I could afford, basically. And um, I remember getting my first V in 93, and it was a Gibson Flying V, <clears throat> white. And um, yeah, I was very excited to play that shape. It was something that I'd always wanted to play, but I never got around to playing. So very, I obviously a lot of my favorite players were playing that shape, but I was kind of, I grew up more in the with the um, with the Super Strats and the and the Floyd Rose, and also a little bit of Les Pauls. But uh, for a while there, the years leading up to that, I was playing like uh, various uh, what do you call Super Strats with the Floyd Rose and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. 93, I got my first V. Lost my virginity. <laughs> the V virginity. <laughs> Who has inspired you as a guitar player and a musician? As far as inspiration goes for my music and my guitar playing, it's so much, it's so much music. It starts with my, basically starts with my parents' record collection, and which is classical music, jazz, blues, and... Um, Starts from there, I guess, because that's where you start, right? With your parents' record collection <laughs> at a very young age. And, uh, but um, obviously, I quickly developed my own taste in music and um, really got into heavy metal and punk music. Anything that my parents wouldn't like, I guess. And um, I'm still there. <laughs> I'm still doing that, the heavy and extreme stuff for the most part. Um, but I like to do, I like to do my heavy music with a lot of soul and a lot of, um, a lot of melody. Is there anyone particularly of the old guitar players that you come in mind when, when you think about uh, the V guitar, Leslie West or Schenker? Or, you know? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Michael Schenker is one of the very iconic guys. Him and Rudolph, his brother in Scorpions. Um, but also KK from Judas Priest. And uh, Trying to think. I mean, even in 83, 84, I'm seeing pictures of James Hetfield with a white V as well, you know. So um, I grew up a lot on the that thrash metal sound and there's a lot of aggressive guitar shapes kind of developing in the 80s, um, but the classic V seemed to be something that a lot of guys were playing, and I was always attracted to that. I always thought it was a really cool shape, but I didn't know how to play it. Like I, I'd pick one up, like if, if I saw one in a shop, or something, I'd play it like this, and then you said, "Ah, oh, you can't sit down. It's just horrible to play." But actually, it's the ultimate guitar to sit down and practice on because you have it like this, and you have this kind of angle. It's almost like a classical guitar angle right so for me it's the ultimate guitar to sit down and practice on i hate now i hate when i'm tracking guitars in the studio sometimes like the engineer will tell you well, try this list paul or something try on a different guitar for a different sound and then you have to have to you have to sit later you have a different angle your elbows up here right when you when you're playing and i always prefer to play like this so this is my i'm very relaxed in my arm and so i think it's the it's the best shape <laughs> for guitar practice. What do you think that makes the V guitar so special? Well, to begin with, it's very aerodynamic. It? It's very, it looks like it's going to take off into the stratosphere. And uh, I don't know, it looks like you're going to take off when you play one of these things. It's just got a, I don't know. I like it. It's kind of got that futuristic, like 50s futuristic atmosphere to it. If you look at the more classic, when they had the more rounded shapes, like on the older ones, it's got more this like rounded. This is very like 50s design in a way, isn't it? I like that, I guess. But then I think obviously nowadays there's a lot of variations like on mine. There's a bit of a different cut here. And um, yeah, I don't know what attracted me. The shape is just it's very exciting, isn't it? It just um, doesn't feel like a doesn't still if it's an old design, it doesn't feel like your dad's guitar. It feels like a little bit more special and modern, I guess. When did you uh, start to play guitar? How old were you? 
I started playing guitar at the age of 13, almost 14 years old. I tried when I was 13, but didn't quite get into it. I guess started more seriously when I was 14. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, the advantage of my generation <clears throat> was that I grew up with no TV. No, I had no TV in my room. I had no internet. I had no uh, mobile phone, <laughs> cell phone. So I just was very, the guitar case, the guitar was in its case under my bed. I'd come home after school. I'd immediately go to the guitar. I was drawn to the guitar as my only source of entertainment, really. And I had my flyers and gig flyers and posters on the wall and my uh, tape recorder where I could record myself playing guitar, a little practice amp. And it was just very, very basic. And uh, you just disappeared into that world, and it just became, um, became the most exciting thing that I could fill my days with and the evenings. So... For me, it was very easy to be focused. Well, I think nowadays, it's harder to be focused on playing an instrument. <laughs> what the, when you started up playing guitar, what was your biggest dream then? Yeah, I'm a little bit different as far as ambition level was super low when I started out. I had no big dreams about, you know, big rock shows and uh, being on tour and stuff like that. I really started with a very... Oh, basically, when I got serious about playing my instrument, I was really into very underground music. And it was all about just maybe playing small shows, making a demo tape, maybe. It was very basic. My, I was not very ambitious at all. As far as, It was just love of music. I just wanted to play music and share it as much as I could through... There was like an underground scene with tape trading you know, before the, before the internet, you know, people would write physical letters with cassettes and you'd make copies of rehearsal tapes, live tapes and uh, demos that you'd made and then send it off to somebody and then it's kind of spread amongst the people who were like enthusiasts in that scene. And that's how it started really for me and just getting the getting some letters back with some like, yeah, I really like that song or I like how you played on that song. That was kind of enough. I wasn't really looking for a lot of... Uh, I wasn't really looking for a lot of fame or anything. I was just doing it because I loved music, I guess. And I wanted to be, in a way, I wanted to be seen and heard, but it was on a very low level. But it went out different, differently the years to come. Yeah. I mean... Um, what, what happened from, from that stage and until now? Um, I mean, if you just were satisfied playing at home and make some small demo tapes and all well, I wasn't only sitting at home practicing out and making demo tapes. I was actually always interested in playing live. I wanted to get out there. I was um, doing interviews with like fanzines and just always wanted to spread the word about my project that I had at the time. And I was always kind of ambitious on a different level, maybe. I wanted to actually do something after a while. And um, I started making a lot of network. I was doing a lot of networking without knowing that I was networking. I was actually networking. <laughs> and getting to know a lot of people in the music scene. And uh, I ended up getting uh, the opportunity to play with an English band in, in 1990. And um, I was invited to become the second guitar player in a band, in a UK band called Carcass from Liverpool. And um, I was with them for three years. And that really, that was my first touring experience, you know, stateside and in Europe and making albums in big studios and stuff like that. That was my that set me on my path, and when I got a taste of that, I realized, wow, this is <clears throat> there are people all over the world that love this kind of music, and um, yeah, that set me on my path for sure that I'm still on today. Take two. I don't know a whole lot about the creation of the V. I guess, yeah. I guess they they brought out a bunch of different futuristic guitars at the same time. I believe mm -hmm. it was like a part of a series. And I think they were inspired by cars, car design. That's what it looks like anyway. Like the Explorer and the, the V. Maybe one more, I'm not sure. <laughs> Actually, the V, they started using it as a blue guitar. Albert King, he was the first artist that was uh, sponsored with the V guitar. That's yeah, I know that, yeah. That's really killer. Now, uh, <laughs> That's old school. Yeah. 
what demands do you put on uh, the pickups um, when you design your own? Uh, uh, Are these? Yeah. Well, they're just basically very high output, I guess, but they're also very natural sounding. They're passive pickups. I don't favor active pickup technology. Um, just maybe because like all the guys that I like don't use active pickups, so that's why I like real tube amps, like old, older Marshalls and stuff like that as well, it's because that's the sound you hear in your head that we grew up listening to all those great albums. If you hear anything from Thin Lizzy to with Gary Moore or, um, you know, all those great old guitar tones, you know, that um, they're obviously not active pickups. <laughs> so I just see yeah, it's just basically um, kind of an, a passive humbucker style. Is that your design or is it a design that Dean made special for your? Uh, yeah, they made, they wind their own pickups in, in, in Tampa, in Florida and... Um, when I joined the company to play the, the guitars, they also offered me an opportunity to design a, a pickup with them. So I worked with the guys in the in that department, and we, yeah, some the usual story, some prototypes back and forth, and I try, listen, and but I mean we nailed it pretty quickly. I gave them a pickup that I really liked, that I had in an old guitar, that I really enjoyed, and um, they based it on that. And then after a few tweaks, it was there. So very easy. What about the wood, uh, the body, mm -hmm. and and the uh, and and uh, mm -hmm. the neck? Uh, do we have any demands of what kind of uh, wood you yeah. use? Yeah. Yeah, I like a mahogany body, and uh, but I like the 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 neck to be uh, maple. It's a harder wood. That's uh, <laughs> that didn't sound right, but it's um, it's a harder wood that uh, basically gives more stability. Uh, especially if you're going to fly, check it in and fly somewhere. You know, we fly, you know, I'm in a band, Arch Enemy, that plays anywhere from Kurgan in Russia to Colombia in South America. You know, we play all over the world, in, in Malaysia or wherever, in Japan. And then next week we're in, the, in Arizona in the States. So, you know, it needs to be just be able to handle those temperature... Um, differences and um, I found that and I have an ebony fretboard which I favor that I love I like the slick feel of that really tight wood and then uh, what about the frets jumbo frets or? I think they're called medium jumbo frets that's what I like yeah. and um, I'm not really too much into the, you know some guitar players are really into all the technical or into all the technical details of their instruments uh, I am to a certain point, but it, uh, I'm also not really that interested. If it sound, I trust my ears. You know, if it sounds good or if it feels good, then it is good for me. And um, what yeah. about the designs, uh, the artsy mm -hmm. designs? Yeah, I'm very involved in those. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, here in the background. You have like an arch enemy symbol, which we've had since the beginning of the band. It's kind of in there somewhere, and then it's got the blood, kind of dried up blood splatter and uh, this has been a very I've played this guitar for a few years and it's we've made a lot of these as well at affordable prices for fans as well for guitar players and it's done very very well so that's been a success um, then I've had another one like this one with a more of a skull design also red black and white red black and white are my favorite colors I guess for guitars but we have a few others as well and um, I mean, just to have being afforded the, given the opportunity to develop your own designs and signature models and stuff like that is a huge honor, of course. It's not definitely not something I started out thinking about. It was not even a dream. I was just, it happened one day and I was very, I just, it was an opportunity and I grabbed it. So I'm very excited to be in that position. Is it important for you when when you have a when you have a signature guitar that it has a price that's affordable for young kids to buy, so they don't have to spend lots of thousands of dollars, but mm -hmm. they can can buy. And is it is it, is it the same uh, model as you use? 
There are some differences, of course, like comparing the the most affordable entry level one that we have compared to the ones that I play. There's difference, of course. Uh, they're made in a different place. They have some different features. Bolt on necks on the on the more affordable ones, but that's super important to have something that is still good and um, has like playability and also an affordable price point because yeah i mean i started out playing very cheap guitars when i started i was playing cheap guitars for a long long time but i would make the best out of the situation and i think the guitars that are available now are a lot better than the ones that were around when i started playing for sure because i remember you used to have like blood bloody fingertips and uh, <laughs> you'd cut yourself and all the the frets would be all sharp and like you know the, there's some craftsmanship but there's a I think it's better today, actually. Usually they say that craftsmanship was better in the old days and much worse now, but I think as far as guitars, I'd say it's better now for the cheap, for the more affordable and mid-range price anyway. But you yourself have become an icon with your, uh, with your paint and, and, and your style playing and, and your, of course your signature guitars. Why do you think that... Um, so many guitar players around the world, of the of the famous guitar players, including yourself, uh, has made the the, the Flying V uh, a trademark. What what makes that icon iconic shape a trademark? I don't know, but I think when you play the Flying V, you've got to you've got to sort of you've got to own it. You know, you've got to look right with that guitar. I, you see some people play it, but they don't really. You can't carry it, you know. It's um, you've got to have the right attitude to play a V, I think, because it's a an attitude. The guitar itself has a lot of attitude, so you need to have that attitude to go with it, to be able to control it, to play it, to project the right kind of uh, feeling. Um, I think a lot of people have chosen it because it's very dramatic shape, yeah, to maybe enhance the the. Um, yeah, the feel of them as a player or something, yeah. But I, I've always been drawn to the Flying Bees. And now, when I've been playing Flying Bees for 20 years, 20 plus years, it's hard to go back to another shape. I think it'd be, because I have a lot of strats, I have a lot of Les Pauls, all those kind of shapes, SGs and stuff like that. But, uh, and I like all those guitars, but for me now, people see me as a V player, and I think once you've been, it's hard to go on stage with another guitar. Even for me, even though I like playing them at home, when I go on stage, I want to play my Flying Bees. It's, it's, it's become one of your trademarks. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's a trademark, but also it doesn't feel right to play. I feel a bit naked without a V, you know, because you, you kind of, it just feels different. The way it hangs on, your, on, on you, on your body, when you strap it on. It's just got a different feel than other guitars, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's that's exactly what is the whole point behind this documentary. You know, uh, why do people play it, and why are s some of the greatest guitar players in this world they made it a trademark? Even Jimi, Jimi Hendrix had a flying right, mm. a famous flying V. Mm -hmm. But um, why? <laughs> you know. Yeah. But but you nailed it a little bit there because it, it's a guitar with an attitude. It's a guitar that makes a statement, it's a rock and roll guitar. Mm -hmm. You would never, of course, Johnny Winter, he plays from Flying V's too, and he's more blues, you know. Yep. But, but it, it sounds, it had that recognizable sound and the look, and it's, it's uh, from appearance, as you said, a, a futuristic uh, design that somebody went into a time machine and went 30 years ahead and, oh, that's, took it back, you know. Yeah. <laughs> They had to do something like that. Who the fuck is inventing a, a futuristic shape like that in those days? Yeah. Well, some they also did the one that was reverse, right? The one that was like that. <laughs> I don't know. Who, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> you, you can still get it, but I think you have to order it special from the guitar fact, from the Gibson factory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine standing on a stage like that, man. You can't even see your feet. Exactly. Okay, uh, the, the fretboard, do we have any uh, demands for the fretboards uh, except the, the, the wood the wood type because, you know, it had to, mm. to maintain the same? 
Yeah, I mean, so I do. You're, you're, you're playing uh, quite fast. Hmm. Yeah. So what, what demands do you have on, on the fretboard? Well, I like my... Uh, as far as the fretboard, I like to have the... It's a dimen I don't know the exact dimensions, but I know that um, we obviously have, have them on file. It's something that we've come up with. It's a bit thinner up here. I guess they call it a tapered neck, which goes... It's a bit thinner up here. And I don't like them to be too chunky and thick. I like to have... I don't want it to be too difficult to play guitar. I want it to be easy. Because <laughs> yeah. I want to be able to express myself. I don't want to fight with the guitar. I just want to... But it's got to be thick enough to, so that it can have tone as well. So it's a balancer, because if you have the two thin necks, you don't have such a good sound. But yeah, like I said, maple necks, ebony fretboards. And these are my inlays that we came up with. But you know, I don't really have... I don't know. I just want it to be comfortable, I guess. You know, that's what it's all about. And I think when you play guitar, you want to feel comfortable. That's why guitar players are like dinosaurs, right? We don't really like to change too much. It's just like you find something that works and I like to stick with it. So, and I find it's the same with amplifiers or cables or pickups or guitar picks, you know, it's the same as if you find something that works and then you, it's hard for me to just change. I'm not the kind of player that jumps around and tries a bunch of different things. If you, if I find something that works that are like my tools that work for me, that, that allow me to create what I want to, that I can get out, what I want to get out creatively, then I stick with it. <coughs> now you mention uh, the, the, the amplifier. What amplifier suits you uh, when you play your, your, your V guitar? What is the best amplifier for you? Well, I've been playing, uh, I've played a lot of different amplifiers through the years, but um, I've moved away from the super high gain amplifiers which might surprise people, but I play like older Marshalls, like the the 800s with the 50 watt 800s, basically Marshall JCM 800s, called 2205 they're called, and I have a few of those. And uh, I use the Tube Screamer to a little bit add a bit more gain and some more and some like tightness to the, to the bottom end and give it that extra metally crunch. And I think you know. That's what I use. So yeah, as far as my tone goes, it's more mid rangey and it's more maybe not as like high, maybe not as high gain and uh, scooped as people might think. You know, that's what a lot of players prefer in the genre that I work in. But actually, I work in the opposite way a little bit because I like the guitars to cut through live. <clears throat> I like to have a big, big sound, but I want it to be fit into the whole picture because we have a low, low end, the bass, the bass drums. I like to. F I've found my own spot in the in the in the soundscape of Arch Enemy. When you when you as a musician compose, when you compose music for one of your bands, especially Arch Enemy, mm -hmm. what is the driving force behind that? What is it, is your influence? What is your inspirations? Hmm. Well, for me, I have to get, when I write music, it, I mean, music can come to you at any time. That's why I always carry it on my phone. I always have a lot of... Sorry. I mean, music can come to you, ideas, musical ideas can come to you at any time. So I have a lot of ideas captured on my phone, voice memos. I just, I'm at an airport and I have to rush into a quiet corner and sing like a melody idea. And then... I have a lot of stuff like that. Those later turn up in songs as well. Um, but a lot of it's obviously just some sitting, playing, noodling around, as you call it, just playing. You play, and usually when I pick up a guitar, um, you kind of study just running through little licks or runs or um, scales maybe or something like that. Just little things that are standard, not really that interesting but you just kind of keeping your hands warm and then suddenly you kind of maybe stumble upon so a lot of my riffs come out of mistakes actually it's like whoa what was that you know okay that's an interesting shape maybe you know I've never done that before um, that's embarrassing to admit maybe but um, <laughs> a lot of my riffs come out of just the just letting the hands do a little bit of whatever really and just kind of sitting playing around I'm often recording what I'm doing and uh, but then I, I fine-tune the riffs and the ideas and you know, I tried to get into like a, 
when I'm when I'm in a creative mood, I kind of reach another level. Where I'm not really, you can't really communicate with me that well. I'm just kind of very focused, and I'm yeah in the zone, as they say, and just riffing. And you know, if I come up with one good riff or one good musical idea, I often come up with two or three or four more in that same session because I'm kind of on a roll. I'm in that zone. I'm in that place where I can really come up with cool stuff. And uh, I guess always striving to get to that place, that creative place. And um, that's, you know, some of the best moments, I guess, are those when you're creating something cool, something that gets you excited. And, um, you yeah, know, when you get excited, you kind of know that, okay, this is going to be exciting for the listeners as well. If you should choose, and I know that would be a hard choice, but if you should choose the five uh, favorite guitars behind you, and that's just a little part of what you have of Martin Reed, what what would those be? Some of my favorite guitars, well, I don't have all of them here. My touring rig, uh, touring equipment is in Germany. We're in Sweden right now, where I live. But um, in Germany, I have all my current touring guitars. Some of my favorites are there, of course, um, which I play on stage every night with the band. But here, I mean, I have this one, which I really love. It's the first prototype of the the splatter model that we did with Dean. This is another one of my favorites. I used this on a couple of albums as well, and also on the road a lot. 2009, 2010, I was using that one a lot on the road. But that one's kind of retired now. I have a new one. It looks the same, but it's a, not the same one. This is another one of my favorite. This, I have another band called Spiritual Beggars, and I use this. It's more. It's a very old school, like late seventies Dean, but it's actually brand new. It's only a few years old, and I use this a lot in the studio as well. It's got the same specs as my signature model, but it's got a more of a, of course a older, more vintage look. So those are some of my favorites, I guess. So this was the first guitar that Dean gave to me. It's like one of the the Michael Schenker ones. And it's a bit different. It's got that V, like on the back of the neck, it's kind of like got a, like a, a, a V bevel, I guess you could say, here. It's a little bit different. I wasn't really used to that, but I kind of like that as well. It's interesting. This one sounds great as well. This has got a great tone, so I use that in the studio sometimes as well. So, those are four anyway of my favorites. <laughs> what about uh, the one, uh, the black one? This one? This one. Now this one's interesting. This is a one-off. This is a, my signature model, but it's a US made custom shop one with um, no, no real history, I've just used it in the studio a little bit. But I, I I got it a couple of years ago, played it on a couple of things on an album, and then I never played it live. So some things never come out on the road. Because I'm not actually um, a guitar player that brings out a lot of guitars on the road. I don't really believe in carrying five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten guitars on the road. I don't, we, I, I'm always in the same tuning. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, I know Dean guitars who endorse, who you know I endorse, and they they supply my instruments. They'd like me to play all my different models during the show, but actually I'm more kind of play like I start the show. If I'm comfortable, I like to stick on the stay on the same guitar as much as possible. If I don't run into any issues, so I'm pretty bad at switching up instruments live. <laughs> they say some of the most conservative people in this world are guitar players. Yeah, and I think they're right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take three, the final. Okay, Michael. Um, when was the first time that you uh, heard about Merciful Fate? Mm. Probably in '83, '84, and then it's a little bit later, I guess. Um, What was your impression? Mm. Well, I heard it at a friend's house. I heard the Melissa album at a friend's house. And, um, yeah, he said, you got to check this out. And, you know, as he did 
just hanging out with friends. He was a couple of years older than me. And he dropped the needle and yeah, I couldn't believe it. It just sounded really unique because of the vocals first and foremost. Like those, it was heavy rock music, but with, um, and also the cover and the, the, the satanic lyrics and imagery was just, uh, yeah, it was kind of very, very interesting. <laughs> the combination of that with like really high quality riffs and song structure, kind of progressive song structure a lot of the time, a lot of different, a lot of riffs, a lot of interesting guitar parts. I noticed that, and uh, yeah, this is one of those bands that just you go deeper and deeper into them, and be probably because of the progressive nature of the music. Do you think that the, that merciful fate style, the, the style, uh, the the guitar riffs, the the music, uh, the original comp uh, compositions has any influence on today's heavy metal? I think Merciful Fate has a. They had a lot of influence, of course, on Metallica. And uh, I'd say on bands like Megadeth or Slayer as well. So, those, that whole generation, they were obviously listening in on the west coast of America and just like really taking a lot of influence from, from Merciful Fate for sure. I know that. I know it's one of Kerry King's favorite bands. Um, so, I know Slayer early. The whole Hello Waits album is kind of like a big tribute to Muscle Fate in a way. It sounds to my ears anyway. Very cool record as well though. Um, and definitely, I mean, I'm very influenced by Muscle Fate as well. So a lot of my writing has been influenced by them as well. So definitely a band that's, they're just one of those bands, one of those very unique and interesting bands that is like an endless source of inspiration in a way. And sometimes it's not really I'm not really copying what they do. I'm just thinking like, well, what would they do in this situation, <laughs> you know, to get out of a situation in, in, in a songwriting way. Um, I just really like their tempo changes and their the riffing style. I know you also had two great guitar players. You had um, Sherman, who's like, a, I believe, a, more of a Strat player, much more like chaotic, almost like Richie Blackmore style. And then you had uh, Michael Denner, who was like a very... Seemed like more composed his solos, like almost like Michael Schenker UFO vibe, a lot of melody, a lot of re like his tone as well was great. He had that really mid rangey tone. I don't know if it was a wah or some kind of a. I don't know what he did, but he had like a really great tone that cut through a lot and really emotional delivery as well. So I love that. That's great. For me, it's like a really great guitar band, you know. Do we have a? Uh, 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 what is your favorite Merciful Fate song? Uh, what's the longest one? <laughs> maybe Satan's Fall, maybe. Just very progressive, a lot of riffs, a lot of parts. And uh, yeah, it's like a journey. A journey through darkness <laughs> and evil <laughs> with lots of great guitar playing. So I love that. Do you think, and this is uh, about, you know, the whole business today combines uh, all the all the stuff that's happening in the music business today. Do you think that the music business has lost its soul, become a farce where the need to become famous is more important than the need to create music for music's sake? Well, the music business has changed a lot over the last 10, 20 years, a lot. Um, to the point where it's not really, everything just changed around so much that you have to sort of, it's hard to navigate sometimes and what's going on. But I got a pretty good handle on that, I think. And for me, I just try to stay in the creation. When I'm creating, I'm always, I'm the 14 year old kid playing guitar. And I have to have that really pure heart when I compose and when I write music and when I record. and. The whole creation has to, for me, has to have that purity and that uh, very single-minded artistic vision. And then, once you've completed that, then the business part, then it becomes a product. Then what you've created and what you poured all your 
hard and soul into is now a product. It's delivered to the record label and you've got to package it, sell it, talk about it a lot. And um, that's not my favorite part, but it's probably even more important than, than the first part if you want it to be heard. So it's like that you have to have two, two coats, you know, you have to wear, you have to be the the musician guy and then you have to put the business jacket on and kind of go out and promote it in a way or just you have to be good at like talking the talk promoting making pe other people feel the excitement about it and um uh, very lucky though speaking for myself i've been very lucky for the past 25 years to have a very solid fan base that's kind of waiting for me to make new music so i don't have to go out and start from scratch and Look at me, listen to me, look what I'm doing. I have a lot of people that are actually a core fan base. Not the biggest in the world, but I have a very good core fan base that loves what I do. And they're always excited to hear from me what I'm doing musically. So that's a huge advantage. But uh, yeah, for sure the industry has changed a lot. I don't know, I get asked a lot the question in interviews about what advice I would give to young musicians starting out today. And... Uh, that's a really difficult question because the landscape is so different now to when, like when I started. But I say that, you know, I still believe in that kid, the 14-year-old kid picking a girl, a boy picking up a guitar. I think that's amazing. There's something very, very special about that. And I don't want to put people down and tell them, don't do it, it's not worth it, you know. Because I think music is a great... To me, music is like the best... Uh, hobby you could ever have because you will never be lonely you'll never be bored you'll never be you can open your mind up in a lot of different ways with music and just you don't even have to become a virtuoso just figuring stuff out from your you know how does this work what I, this record I like and then you figure it out it'll be like wow that's really cool it's like a, you're opening up a lot of uh, doors I think in your mind when you work with music and it doesn't have to be on such a professional level even I think uh, so uh what now, Michael? What is your future <laughs> plans? Hmm. My future plans are just to keep on playing music because, you know, I'm one of those... I'm one of those persons that I'm not doing this because I want to do it or because I have to do it. I'm doing it because it's my... No, I'll start again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But as far as my future goes, I can't really see a different future than just keep on playing because it's not something that I I do for money or for fame. It's because I really I have this passion for it. I have to do it. So it's my whole life. So playing guitar is how I live. It's how I breathe. And um, it's very important for me. <laughs> yeah, but if you have the drive and... The, you know the need to play you just have to play and if it's down at the local uh in denmark we call it bodega yep <laughs> or, uh, or is it or in the winter stage and it doesn't make any difference the, the the need to play you just have to to do it man i think that's right i think there's always people have lots of different reasons for making music for playing music for playing the guitar but um I think it's all connected somehow anyway. I think everybody starts with just a passion for the instrument. Do you have any any uh, plans uh, for develop your Flying V or are you satisfied this is the perfect model, the perfect shape or do you have already, because guitar players are conservative people as we talked mm. about. I've actually have... changed something. I've changed something recently on um, the next generation of my guitars. I only have one one of these knobs, so just one volume. So I just kind of took. I have two volumes on these. No tone, but a, no tone knob. But a, I've always had two volumes for some reason, so I could do some like kind of like sounds like that. But I wasn't really using that a lot, and just like to keep things as simple as possible. So now I only have one to keep track of here on my new ones. So that's the only change really. And then otherwise I'm just happy. Like I said, I've been 
fortunate to design my own guitar and it just does it does what I need what I need it to do you know so I'm I'm very pleased so I can't don't foresee changing anything